recording on this cool we we are started jared <laughs> well once again um thank you for jumping on uh, on contaminated sounds uh the thank interviews and uh where are you based now are you in oregon or are you in the west coast or yeah i'm in oregon i'm in portland oh cool cool did i pronounce yeah. oregon right or you know people say or is it or uh you know there's debates or about pronunciation regarding... a, lot of people say, a lot of people say oregon which yeah, is yeah not the way anyone from oregon says it it's Oregon. yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's like uh new orleans you know like uh if you go right. down there the, the the folk down there will say new orleans but, new orleans you know, yeah i hear you know i'm from the north i'm on the east coast right now uh northeast and uh people yeah. say new orleans it's right right that's <laughs> They'll, you know, locals will be like, no, no, but <laughs> yeah, totally. Um, and where was, are you based? I'm in uh, Beacon, New York, right now. Um, okay. It's like two hours. Oh, drive. It's probably like an hour and a half from the New York City. Um, but I, I'm originally from Boston, Massachusetts, myself. Gotcha. Um, just a Northeast guy. I <clears throat> had family out in. Uh, you know, like Southern California and San Diego and stuff, but haven't traveled, haven't had the opportunity to go to like San Fran or North North Pacific or like uh, Seattle or Oregon. Um, I, I've heard it's beautiful out there. It is very beautiful. Um, it rains here. It rains a lot here, you know, Yeah, yeah. Um, as everyone knows, but that's the reason that it's, you know, it's green year round. You know, we have a wide diversity of plants and animals that exist here. So it's it's a pretty special place. Yeah. So, did you yeah. grow up uh, in Oregon, or did you did you move there, uh, or so? I, yeah. Sorry. Go. No, it's okay. Um, I was born in Redwood City in mm. uh, the Bay Area of California, um, and we lived there until I was about eight years old. And mm. then my dad kind of gathered up the family and moved us up to Oregon onto a little like a eighty acre farm out in the middle of nowhere. Oh, cool. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, <clears throat> was there a specific reason he went there or for like work or did he just think it was a better uh, place to raise a family? Um, yeah, I think he, you know, he had spent some time in Oregon when he was a child hmm. um, in Eugene, actually, and kind of always wanted, kind of always had a dream to bring his family back to Oregon someday. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I think just kind of as time went on, he really wanted to create a peaceful environment to bring up, to bring up the family. Yeah. And um, yeah, that's what he did. So, so those, for those not familiar with your work, what got you into your your? I mean, you have a, an impressive resume already, and and your I, I've uh, listened to your your sounds and, and your just music. It's beautiful. So, how? I mean, from the North Pacific, you know, in Oregon, it's like I don't associate jazz or soul, you know. Um, with that region uh, per se so what yeah. got you into that style of music and you know really enthralled and passionate to continue with that type of music yeah i mean it was really fostered at home um you know like i said after we had moved out to this farm and you know just so far away from everything i didn't you know i was very isolated at that point and i think um it really was kind of a natural progression for me to sort of turn to music um, in my isolation. And I was always interested in music, but I didn't, I didn't really like take it seriously as a career mm -hmm. until much later. But, you know, but kind of growing up through from that like eight years until, you know, I was in high school, I was always listening to music and kind of rifling through my father's record collection, which was, you know, he had a lot of great old soul and jazz records in there. Well, you know, Aretha Franklin, Ed James, and, you know, Al Green, mm. just like a lot of the old classic soul records that became, you know, kind of the uh, the foundation for me. Yeah. And then, of course, a lot of jazz as well, you know, Miles Davis and Oscar Peterson and Sonny Rollins, all, you know, all kinds of great music, which mm. really kind of just informed and, um, you know, sort of built up, I guess, a foundation for me to to create my own sound. I think I read somewhere you, or uh, maybe in a, uh, one of your bios that your father was a record producer or he had his own studio or? He had his own studio, yeah, in Redwood City. Um, and like my first memories are from that space. We lived there. 
Mm. It was not, it was not a home at all. It was just like a, it was kind of like in this like quasi industrial area. Um, it's a very, not a very like warm space, you know, but it was like, it was a recording studio. It was a working recording studio. So he had musicians coming and going yeah. all the time. And um, uh, so, yeah, I, I have a lot of memories of that space and, um, but Sorry, I just got like a tiny bit distracted. There's a little pop-up came up on my screen here. <laughs> uh, no worries whatsoever, man. Uh, trying to get these things out of the way here. So, okay, there we go. Um, did that answer the question? I'm sorry. I think so. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, yeah, that's once again, another new norm is uh, our, you know, just notifications. Um, yeah, yeah. Oh, you were uh, asking about my father though. Yeah, yeah. I mean, do you, Reflecting, would that be like a because of his interest in his, you know, um, and um, you know, work in the music uh, realm? Did that really influence you in in pursuing it full time? Or I think definitely in some ways. Um, I mean, I remember, you know, my father. Aside from running a recording studio, he also was a musician himself, and oh, cool. um, became a very accomplished jazz guitar player. Um, but I think that, you know, just growing up with that in the house, you know, I was always in that environment of music and creation. Hmm. And, um, you know, I think that that was, that was a good, um, it was a good sort of, I don't know, seed bed for me, I guess, so to speak. Um, so yeah, I, I think that it probably wasn't until I was 13 that I really, um, I started to gravitate to the piano. Hmm. Um, and I really started to take music a little more seriously at that point, as maybe this was a direction I wanted to go, you know. And I haven't, I hadn't even really explored my voice in a very serious way at that point either. So mm -hmm. I think it was really after I made my way to the piano and, you know, started getting comfortable with the piano and then introducing my voice into that, you know, situation and kind of developing the two together. Um, yeah, it's probably around that 13, 14, 15 years old range. And up until that time, I wasn't really seriously playing instruments. I, you know, I had tinkered around on the drums when I was like two years old in the recording studio and stuff like that. But music was not like, a, it wasn't like a clear path for me. In mm -hmm. fact, my father, you know, being in the industry kind of, you know, he didn't encourage me to, to be a part of, you know, to go down that path because he knew the pitfalls that were involved. So, you know, he didn't necessarily steer me away either, but he didn't, he didn't push me in that direction. Kind of let me figure it out on my own, which was nice. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think, um, I think that's, that's important too, to really just discover your, what you want to express through a chosen medium, you know? Yeah. Um, of course it's, it, though it is kind of like on the, well, I've, I've studied, uh, I have a degree in criminal justice and so um, oh, wow. I've, I've studied a lot of psychology and sociology. Yeah, okay. then I uh, actually, yeah, then I went into like graphic web design and it, it took me a while to figure out that I love art and um, yeah. found my medium and in, in, uh, documentation with the, the camera. And now I kind of paint so since it's, you know, kind of isolating and stuff like that. But yeah, um, yeah at, at 13 myself, I was, uh, yeah, not, I, I didn't know, I, I, I didn't really choose a medium at the time. I was more was kind of playing sports and stuff, uh, <laughs> but um, it took me a while to kind of discover that. And I'm always jealous though of people who find their thing, you know, and then stuck with it and was able to build a, a, a flourishing career off that uh, early on. Because if, uh, if I could save myself half the, the struggles and uh self-discovery it would have been uh maybe a smoother journey but journey but however i mean hindsight I, i've uh, kind of lived i've seen seen it all so <laughs> i mean yeah. it's been cool but um <laughs> to wrap back um to to yourself and uh, I, I was just going to make a point i guess of like I, I find it funny that I've spoken to a lot of musicians or artists that their family, uh, either mother or father, were musicians or 
or mm -hmm. in the the creative field them, uh, themselves and then the uh, uh, that person the the child kind of grows up to do similar things or in a uh, similar uh, creative path per se mm -hmm. I just find it kind of interesting but um, yeah uh, did you go eventually you went to uh, get formally trained in music is that correct or really no, no. I, I mean I've never been formally trained um, I did go um, out of high school I went to a community college hmm. called Clackamas Community College here which has a, a actually one of the better music programs in the state and uh, I kind of went there with the intention to study music and I think I studied, you know, I went through the, what, like one semester of the uh, theory program before I just realized that that was not for me at all. Yeah. <laughs> um, just a lot of the concepts just didn't make sense to me. To me, it didn't relate to music as I thought of it. Mm. Um, I think I just, you know, because up until that point, I had been largely self-taught with, some, you know, a, a little tutelage from my father. Um, but, you know, for the most part, I was kind of more about the feeling and the vibe of music. And it was, it was less about like paper and notes on a, on a page. It was less about, you know, quantifying and the math side of things. That was not how I thought of music. So I decided pretty quickly that that wasn't for me, but I continued to, you know, perform in the uh, vocal jazz ensemble and the jazz band um, and the, and the, chamber choir as well. Mm. So I was very much involved in the music, you know, program still. Um, I just wasn't like, I wasn't becoming like formally trained at all. <laughs> well, I mean, oh, that's argumentative, right? It's, um, you know, you have theory in one, one, one place where it's more on a, the academic standpoint and more just thought exercises where you, you're actually going out there and performing, you know, and that's, that's music, man. And like, that's the yeah. real, practical aspect of music is going out there and being in a you know performing in a crowd and and um yeah. and that's what i find so <clears throat> i don't know uh really intriguing about soul jazz and, and that type of music folk um it's it's the ability to you know touch the soul of of uh the the listener yeah particularly i love live you know performances and it's like you have that whole body uh experience i don't know yeah experience like the the, the the sound just resonates throughout the body and it's just a cool experience uh, yeah. but what really drove you to that like sound i mean like i don't think maybe i asked that but i don't think we got to a a critical point was it the culture around you or in that organ like where you grew up or what drew you drove you to more of like that that sound I guess um I mean well I guess to come back to yeah your original thoughts about Portland which is a lot of people don't associate Portland with um you know like we actually have a really thriving music scene here hmm. in terms of jazz and um and our soul scene here is becoming kind of suddenly internationally known mm -hmm. um just clearly clear out of the blue like everybody's yeah. kind of been like what's going on over there in portland because all of a sudden you know a bunch of people are popping up all these artists and so there has been a thriving scene here for a long time it's just kind of been under the radar and um yeah i think that definitely has played a part in you know who i am as mm -hmm. a musician and um yeah, I mean, there are a lot of phenomenal musicians here and some of which who, you know, well, Portland is one of the most moved to city these days. I don't know if you're aware of that, but people are moving here from like New York and LA all the time hmm. and bringing with them, you know, monstrous talents, of course. So it's quickly becoming even more, you know, starting to have a little bit more diversity and a little more flair um, as we get little, you know, little flavor from other cities and different yeah, parts of the world. Yeah kind of coming into portland it's cool kind of sounds like in seattle in the late 80s 90s when grunge was uh you know seeding yeah. you know it was more uh, the local organic movement of grunge but then you know popular culture picked up on it then there was a mass influx of transplants you know and then it was like 
yeah in the yeah, mid 90s i would say like grunge kind of died out because of over commercialism but yeah, yeah. um that's cool man oh yeah because i i really have to dive into that region more just explore sounds from that your region because i i've just been in my kind of east coast bubble a bit or I don't know, maybe it's just uh, the pandemic. I've just been zonked out. <laughs> um, Understandably so. Yeah, yeah. Well, speaking of that, I, I, um, how have you adapted? I, I know you were touring a bunch prior. And uh, how have you adapted with the, this new norm? Or hopefully we'll get back soon to live performances. But Yeah, actually, you know, I haven't done a live show since March. Um, of last year, which was right around the time, you know, the pandemic hit. And uh, actually, coincidentally, the last show that I did here in Portland at the Atlantis Lounge, I got COVID that night. Mm, yeah, a bunch know. of other people in the place got it. It was crazy. Our, our buddy had just come home from Italy. And of course, Italy had been hit really hard at that time. Right. So, yeah, yeah. Um, unfortunately, he came home and gave it to a bunch of people. Um, so I got COVID like really early on and got that out of the way, which was kind of a relief in a way. It wasn't yeah. fun. It was yeah. a of feeling, you know, pretty, pretty crappy, but, um, but yeah, to really get to the point of the question, I guess, I'm just starting to kind of learn to adapt, you know, learning that the, like this live stream, this new kind of live stream culture is becoming very important mm. you know, to subsist. Um, I've only done one live stream as of, now but i have another one coming up on the 25th hmm. i'm gonna be right from here in my studio my home studio and uh yeah it's 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 been a hard i guess it's been a hard one for me to get on board with because i have a hard time when i'm watching live streams i have a hard time getting invested and feeling the vibe you know it's like it just doesn't feel like it does when you're in the room with someone and they're performing for you so it, it's tough but it seems to be a necessary evil, I guess, so to speak. Mm. Um, so yeah, I, I'm learning to adapt, but I guess the, the really wonderful thing about, you know, having all this free time was that it enabled me to finish my record mm. and to get it out there finally after six years of not having any new content out there in the world, so. And what, so what is uh, your new record's name? Or it's out now, by the way? Or... It's out. Yeah, yeah, cool. Beat the Change. Cool, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, just a little plug. I don't know when this it should be, a, maybe a couple weeks down the road when this goes live. So, but I always like to kind of, if you have new work, I always like to kind of allow you to plug it. Yeah, yeah. But, um, yeah, 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 I could imagine when you just forced, well, actually, this is what happened to me too. It's where I'm just like forced to kind of, you know, create stuff. And, uh, I've had to adapt drastically because my whole, like I said earlier, my whole premise was documenting live performances and you yeah. know backstage. So that um, kind of obviously was put to a standstill. But then I started kind of adapting new ideas and uh, and adapting to more internalized projects of fine art photography and stuff like that. And mm -hmm. uh, obviously this series as well, where I, I get to engage with uh, artisans. Um, which has yeah. kind of kept me sane and I, I just love talking to a diverse group of people so um yeah i, I get it though where it's like at least you know what i i've you know being on the road and tour you don't have too much time to really think you know or you know, maybe yeah. you're going you know, you're going and then um you know you generally don't have time to really reflect and think on new new stuff well i don't know i i i that's kind of maybe it's kind of my version or uh, what I assume. The I mean, I would agree with that from my own perspective. I feel mm -hmm. like when I've been out on tour, it's like usually the, the, you know, the schedule is so rigorous that there's not a lot of time for much yeah. of anything other than, you know, getting a little bit of sleep, trying to cram some food in, you know, in between whatever little time that you, whatever small bits of free time that you have in between doing shows and, getting from place to place. It's like, it's just, uh, it's a struggle. Then uh, let me pose this kind of broad question. Like why still do it then? Why not 
you know, do something else, I guess. Why continue to pursue or create uh, your, your craft? And, and um, particularly nowadays, you know, when music is, the industry is so up in the air, but um, I guess, we, yeah, why? Why do you continue to create music? I mean, at the end of the day, it's my passion. You yeah. know, it's the thing that makes me feel the most alive. And, and you know, when I'm in that creation mode and, uh, you know, if I'm in my home studio here and I'm in a good flow and, or if I'm in the middle of writing a song and I'm like really digging the, whatever, the lyrical content that I've come up with, it's like that feeling that I get of like, man, yes, yes, this is, I feel so good. I guess that's, that's what it is. I do it for that feeling. Mm. Mm. Now, have you, uh, I guess, another kind of broad question is any, I, I, it may be hard to answer kind of like, do you have a top uh, memorable performance or, you know, live performance when you're on the tour? Like you have this specific like memory of a venue that was really special or a performance that was super special or, or are they all kind of uh, memorable? I mean, there have been a lot of highlights here and there, you know, um, things like getting to perform at the um, North Sea Jazz Festival in Holland, mm. which is, uh, you know, one of the most widely recognized jazz festivals in the world. That was a huge honor, to, you know, to be able to perform there. And I actually performed there the same night that D'Angelo did. Mm. Um, he, of course, performed on a massive stage <laughs> yeah. compared, to, compared to where I performed but um but yeah it was like a really really incredible memory yeah um, oh, remember, yeah because we were part of the festival because we were artists we were essentially given access to go almost anywhere we wanted to so when the D'Angelo concert started we were basically like we just like walked right back stage practically so we could like see D'Angelo and the band coming down the hallway, you know, and kind of stepping onto the stage from the back. It was, it was really cool. Yeah, no, it sounds amazing. First yeah. of all, just festival in Amsterdam. That, that's I, one of my favorite cities. Uh, I have a friend who's from, who lives there and he, he's Dutch. And uh, I think I, I went to visit him in 2015 and I'm just longing to go back, you know? And the, yeah. the ability to travel and to go see people uh, across the way, across the pond, and uh, it's nothing like it. It's it just uh, yeah. just interacting with people physically. You know, I, I caught up with them mm -hmm. uh, via Zoom, but I, I'm kind of hitting a wall. I don't know if you are too with the the digital Zoom kind of platform. Are yeah. are you feeling that same way too? Can you explain a bit more. What what do you mean by that exactly? Oh, I guess like I, I've heard of like, I don't know, so many things and groups on my end have been via Zoom mm -hmm. and, and people kind of go through bouts of Zoom burnout. Um, I like, I guess this type of interaction kind of just burns people out. Um, yeah. I, I felt it a bit uh, at times, but then also not as much as others I, I've heard of, but I, I was curious if if you experienced any of that or not whatsoever. I guess I haven't yet. Um, you know, I probably don't do this maybe as much as you do either. So I, I'm not sure. I mean, I have been doing, a, you know, quite a bit of interviews lately and a lot of them have been through Zoom. Hmm. But, you know, I, I mean, I haven't really had issues so far. It's been important to me to do these interviews because it's the only way that I really have to promote my record right now. Yeah. So, so I, I, I guess I really appreciate these opportunities and, you know. Now speaking of uh, your new work, when did you release it? Uh, when was so that? It, it was, I think it came out November 30th. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. Oh, cool. So it's uh, been out for a few months. Now, did you collaborate with anybody uh, on this uh, rec record, or is it strictly was that your um, self-production and stuff like that? Um, I mean, it's totally self-produced, but uh, yeah, I mean, I've got some collaborations on the record. Um, track number two has uh, Moonchild. Hmm. Really cool. Um, are you familiar with Moonchild? 
I am not. I, I uh, generally, um, I try to go just unencumbered into these conversations and uh, <laughs> uh, just off the cuff conversations. And uh, so I am not, I was listening to, um, before we jumped on, Universal Chord. Yeah. Or, um, official audio. <laughs> But I, <laughs> I, I'm not too familiar with that. Sorry, I have to dive into your new record, <laughs> to be That's honest. Okay. Um, yeah, um, well, yeah, you should check out Moonchild for sure. They're like a little trio out of uh, LA. And honestly, like probably my favorite band on the planet right now. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> They're bands. I'm sorry, I sounded uh, kind of ignorant on that, on that matter. <laughs> I. I for some reason, I zonked out. I thought it was a uh, a title of a, a, a song on your song. album. song. No, I was talking about the band Moonchild. <laughs> okay, yeah. Yeah. I am not familiar with them. So. Well, not you should definitely them. check them out. Incredible music. Very, like, super vibey and soulful and jazzy and sophisticated. And, yeah, it's great music. Are they also a West Coast band or? Uh... Yeah, they're from LA. Oh, cool. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'll definitely check them out. Um, man, sorry about that. It's all good, man. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, there's there are several collaborations on the record. I've got um, you know Sammy Figueroa, who's one of the the finest Latin percussionists on the planet, is on several of the songs on the album. Hmm. Um, and then I've got you know some cats from here in Portland. Cool. Several different uh, you know some horn players, some wood woodwind players. Um, yeah, it's a bunch of great, great players. Pretty long list of personnel actually on this album. So cool. now, yeah. how did you um, kind of collaborate? Did you have to kind of record separate tracks in individual studios and then kind of merge it all together? Um, well, yeah. I mean, well, a lot of this was already done long oh, yeah. before, before COVID. But uh, the Moonchild collaboration actually was kind of one of those long distance situations. Moonchild had been touring extensively for years. And mm. when I had contacted them, you know, and sent them the stems for this song, I'll be your radio, um, you know, they were out on the road and they literally just recorded their parts from their hotel room and sent them to me while they're out on, while they're out on tour. Oh, wow. So that was yeah. really cool. Yeah. That's kind yeah. of uh, the, the era we live in now, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, any like dream collaborations, I guess, like somebody you haven't worked with yet? Um, God, I mean, there could be so many, um, let's see. Um, God, who would I love to work with? I, you know, Leanne Le Havis, a singer from the UK. I hmm. would love to sing with her. She's one of my favorite singers. Um, God, there's, there's just so many, honestly. I'd like to do something with Butcher Brown. You familiar with them? I know. I'm <laughs> I <laughs> just uh, you know, I just I'm just a, a guy who uh is always learning. So uh yeah, but, me you know. yeah, and that's fine. Um yeah, Butcher Brown Butcher Brown's like a really, really dope, like predominantly instrumental kind of music, but they, they, you know, they like record everything to tapes. It's got this really like old seventies kind of headhunters vibe, nice. like Herbie yeah. Hancock headhunters vibe. Hmm. Um, yeah, and they're out of, uh, I think DC or, so, or somewhere around in that area. Ooh. I'm just kind of on their site. That's cool. Yeah, so I have to check them out, man. Uh, yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> um, Oh. Um, man, I'm going to have to wrap up here in like probably, I don't know, five to 10 minutes. Yeah, yeah. If that's possible. That works. Um, I guess then. Um, so where would you like to evolve your stuff then? Where, what's next? You have this new album out. Um, how you actually, how are you kind of uh, promoting, obviously through kind of conversations like this, but yeah, was it, of course, you, how did you release it through... Um, what channels, I guess? Well, I've got a record label in the UK, Dome Records. 
Um, so they've been hugely instrumental and helpful in you know, getting the album out into all the proper avenues. Um, it's like a smaller record, record label, which I kind of feel is for me, the right fit. You know, I've never really felt super comfortable with going with a big record label. Mm. They oftentimes want to start dipping their fingers into your creative control and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, but Dome Records has been super, super, you know, supportive of me. And um, yeah, honestly, Peter, so Peter's the, the head of Dome Records. He and I have a really great relationship and I worked with him on my first record as well, or following my first record. And, uh, you know, this go around, he's taken upon himself to bring some other people onto the team. So we've got Fiona Bloom, uh, who actually I think facilitated you and I meeting today. Mm. So she's my new PR lady out of uh, New York City and she's just like incredible. She gets so much done. So it's been really nice to kind of bring some new people onto the team. And you know, it's, it, it's invaluable to bring people who have, you know, certain skill sets into the situation and delegate, let them handle the things that you don't want to do. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's one of the things that it took me a while to kind of figure that out. Just the importance of, it's like, I'm a creative person. I want to spend my time creating music and I don't want to, I don't want to be doing really a lot of this administrative stuff that, you know, it's not that fun. Yeah. So yeah, it's nice to bring, build a team around you of people that, have expertise in a, a wide variety of areas you know that can really make your your situation go yeah yeah and uh, i guess so i think just futuristic where do you see uh your work evolving to or what are your hopes you know of course it's very hard to tell with the live performance aspects still uh mm -hmm. everything up in air but uh what, what what would you hope to envision for the rest of this year and, and, and a couple years down the road for say music wise and career wise? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, well, I have a little bit of a hard time believing that live shows are gonna really resume in the way that we want them to hmm. this year. Um, you know, I have been talking with my booking agent out of Germany about you know the summer festivals in in Europe, which it sounds like there's a lot of talk that they could potentially happen, but I mean the question becomes: Is it financially viable for anyone if it has to be like 50% capacity and we have to you know socially distance everything? Does it really is it worth it to even bother? Right. Hmm. Sorry, I'm getting a little sidetracked from your from your question, but um, I guess I'm trying to say that I. I don't really see a lot of live shows happening this year. Um, and and that's just is what it is. It's a little unfortunate, of course, and and difficult for people like me trying to trying to make a living and promote a record, you know. Um, Which but, is entitled again, so we can um, kind of plug it at the end of the show. <laughs> the, the title of the album? Yes. Sorry. Yeah, so um, my, my new album is called Be, Be The Change. Um, just came out a few months back and uh, yeah, really, it would be nice, you know, to be able to do some live shows and, and really promote the show properly. But for now, I'm kind of relegated to, to doing interviews and, and, and again, I appreciate your time so much and folks like you, you know, giving me this platform to, to talk about the album. And... Of course, man. And I, I look forward to diving deeper into the new album myself and actually exploring Moonchild and Butcher Brown. I always like coming out of these conversations, learning, uh, you know, new sounds or new bands and new performers and new artists. Uh, that's, that's the goal of this for me, at least. And also sure. being able uh, to be a vessel for kind of showcasing artists that maybe people haven't heard of yet and, and they can discover your work as well. So thank you for giving me your time. And uh, I hope you stay uh, healthy and safe and the same with your family and stuff. So appreciate that. Same to you. Cool, man. And uh, be well and uh, have a great probably afternoon or mid <laughs> afternoon or early afternoon there. Right. Or I don't know. Yeah. yeah. It's like 1230 here. Oh, cool, man. Well, have a great rest of the day. Thanks, Robin. I appreciate it. Appreciate it's it, man. Good. All take right. Care. Take care, man. Be well.